Book 10. Meanwhile, highest Olympus opened, and the father of gods and men called a council in the starry halls from which he surveyed all lands, the Dardan camp and the Latin peoples. The gods took their seat, and their lord began. Why have you gone back on your word, divine ones, and fight among yourselves? I forbade Italy to go to war with Troy. This quarrel thwarts my will. What fear has caused these humans to rush to arms? There shall come a time, do not hasten it, when wild Carthage will open the Alps and pour down upon Rome. Then may they fight and ravage each other. For now, cease your strife and assent with good will to my covenant. Thus Jupiter briefly, but golden Venus made no brief reply. Father eternal, power of the universe, what, for what else may we appeal to now? Do you see how insolent the Rutulians are? How Turnus, swollen with pride, rides his chariot through the crowds, rushing into war with Mars at his back? The Teucrians are no longer protected by their walls. The fighting has moved inside the gates, and the trenches flow with blood. Aeneas, far away, does not know of these dangers. Will you never allow this siege to be lifted? A second army threatens the walls of an infant Troy, and again there rises from Aetolian Arpi, a son of Tydeus. I feel I myself will be wounded again. I, your child, will stop another mortal spear. If the Trojans have sought Italy without your leave, abandon them, and let them pay for their sin. But if they have followed all the oracles given by gods above and shades below, how can anyone now subvert your will and establish destiny anew? Why should I even mention the fleet burned on the shores of Eryx, or the storm stirred up by Aeolus, or Iris sent from the clouds? The fighting has moved inside the gates, and the trenches flow with blood. Aeneas, far away, does not know of these dangers. Will you never allow this siege to be lifted? A second army threatens the walls of an infant Troy, and again there rises from Aetolian Arpi a son of Tydeus. I feel I myself will be wounded again. I, your child, will stop another mortal spear. If the Trojans have sought Italy without your leave, abandon them and let them pay for their sin. But if they have followed all the oracles given by the gods above and shadows below, how can anyone now subvert your will and establish new destiny? Why should I even mention the fleet burned on the shores of Eryx or the storm stirred up by Aeolus or Iris sent from the clouds? And now Juno is mobilizing hell, a sector of the universe as yet untried. And Electo is turned loose on the upper world and raves through the cities of Italy. I no longer care about empire, my hope, while fortune still smiled. Let those win whom you want to win. If there is no country your hardened wife will allow the Trojans, then by the smoking ruins of Troy, I pray, let me at least withdraw Ascanius, father, unscathed from war. Let my grandson survive. Aeneas, yes, may be tossed on unknown seas and follow fortune's lead, but let me protect this child and rescue him from this terrible conflict. Amathus is mine, high Paphos and Cythera, a shrine in Adelia, he can live out his life there without weapons or glory. Let it be your grandson's decision, your grand decision that Carthage crush Italy. Nothing then would hinder the Tyrian cities. But what good has it done him to survive the war? Escape Greek fire, endure endless perils on land and sea, while his two Koreans sought to found a new Troy and Latium. Better to have settled on the dying ashes where Troy once stood. You might as well give them back their Samoas and Xanthus, and let them suffer forever Ilium's sorrows. Then regal Juno, furious. Why do you force me to break my silence and tell the whole world my heart's deep sorrow? Did any man or god compel Aeneas to make war on the Latins? He sought Italy at the call of the fates. Yes, driven on by Cassandra's raving. Did I advise him to leave his camp or entrust his life to the winds? To put a boy in charge of their defenses at the height of war? to tamper with Etruscan loyalties or stir up peaceful nations to war. What god, what cruel power of mine undid Aeneas? Where is Juno in all of this, or Iris sent from the clouds? It is indeed monstrous that Italians are burning your infant Troy, and that Turnus has taken a stand in his native land, Turnus, a mere grandson of old Pilumnus, and whose mother is only the goddess Vanilia. 
But what about the Trojans torching the Latin people and pillaging their fields, dragging a bride away from her betrothed, offering peace in one hand and arming ships with the other? You have the power to whisk Aeneas away from the Greeks and substitute empty mist for the man. You are as well perfectly capable of turning their ships into so many nymphs. But for us to help the Rutulians is disgraceful? You say Aeneas is far away and doesn't know? Let him be utterly ignorant and really far away. Paphos is yours, Idalium, High Cythera. Why bother with a city teeming with war or with savage hearts? Is it because I am toppling the tottering Phrygian state? Is it I? Or is it he who dumped the Trojans right in front of the Greeks? What cause was there that Europe and Asia should rise up in arms and ravage their peace treaties in treachery? Was it I who led Paris, the Dardan adulterer, to rape Sparta? Did I arm the man and goad him on with lust? All this was you. It was then that you should have been afraid for your people. And now you come on late with your unjust complaints and petty bickering. Thus Juno's plea, and all the celestials murmured various assent, a sound like wind rising in the forest with whispers, with moans, that tell the sailors a great storm is coming. Then the Father Almighty, the greatest power in the universe, begins, and as he speaks, the high house of the gods grows silent. Earth's foundations tremble, still goes the air, the winds are hushed, and the high seas calmed. Take my words to heart and keep them there. Since Ausonians and Teucrians cannot form an alliance and your dissension has no end, I shall make no distinction between the hopes and fortunes of either Trojan or Rutulian, whether it be Italy's fortune that holds the camp or Troy's tragic error and false prophecies, nor do I absolve the Rutulians. The efforts of each will bring suffering or success. Jupiter rules over all alike. The fates will find their way. And he nodded assent by his brother's Stygian waters, by the banks that seethed with black and swirling waters. Then Jupiter rose from his golden throne, and the gods escorted him to the threshold. Meanwhile, the Rutulians pressed on at every gate, intent on slaughtering men and wringing walls with fire. The Trojans were penned inside with no hope of escape. They made a desperate stand on the high towers, barely able to man the wall's perimeter. Asius, Thymotes, the two Asaraki, Castor, and old Thimbris were in the lead. At their side were Sarpedon's two brothers, out of high Lycia, Clarus, and Thamon, Acmon of Lernessus. His whole body straining came up with a huge chunk of mountain, himself as huge as his father, Clytius, or Menestheus, his brother. They defended with spears and stones, notched arrows and fire. In their midst, the Dardanian boy himself, Venus's most rightful care, his glorious head unhelmeted, glittered like a jewel, set in yellow gold to adorn neck or brow, or as ivory gleams inlaid in boxwood, or ocrean ebony. Hair streaming over his milk-white neck, encircled in gold. You also, Ismaris, your high-born kinsman, saw inflicting wounds with poisoned arrows. You, Ismaris of Lydia, where men work rich fields, and the Pactolus irrigates them with gold. And Menestheus was there, yesterday's hero, exalted for driving Turnus from the wall. Capus, too, who gave his name to Campania. Thus the struggles of war. Aeneas, though, was cutting through shallow seas at midnight. When he had left Evander and entered the Tuscan camp, he met the king and announced his name and race, what he sought, what he offered. And he informed the king of the forces Mezentius was recruiting and of Turnus's violent heart. He spoke to him about the trust that could be placed in things human, and as he talked, he entreated. Without delay, Tarkon joined forces and struck an agreement. Freed from the prophecy, the Lydians boarded ship under divine ordinance and entrusted themselves to a foreign leader. Aeneas sailed in the flagship, Phrygian lions crouched under her beak. Above rose Ida, a sight most welcome to Trojan exiles. There sat great Aeneas, pondering the fortunes of war. And Pallas, staying close to his left, questioned him, now about the stars that guided them through the night, and now of his trials on land and sea. Now open, Helicon muses and chant the roll call of the men from Tuscan shores, who armed the ships and sailed with Aeneas. At their head, Massacus cut through the water in the bronze-plated tiger. 
a thousand men served under him, from Cusium and Cosse, armed with quivers of arrows and deadly bows. With him was Abbas, whose entire contingent bore dazzling arms, and his ship gleamed with a gilded Apollo. To this grim general, Papalonia had given six hundred warriors, and Ilvia three hundred, an island rich in the Calabese, inexhaustible ore. Third came Asilus, the great interpreter between gods and men, a man to whom sacrificial entrails revealed their meaning, as did stars, bird song, and prophetic lightning. He hurried a thousand men to war in close formation, bristling with spears. Men placed under his command by Pisa, a city born by the river Alpheus, but transplanted in Tuscany. Aster came next, second to none in looks, Aster who trusted his mount and flickering weapons. Three hundred men, all of one mind, followed him, whose homes were in Cary, in the plains of Minio, and in ancient Pergi, and who breathed the heavy air of Gravisque. Nor would I pass you by, Cunerus, bravest of the Ligurian warriors, or you, Capavo, with your few followers, swan plumes on your crest, the insignia of his father's form, but a reproach to you, O god of love, for they say that Sinus, grieving for his beloved Pathon, was singing in the shade of his sister's poplars, and while he consoled his sorrow with music, whitened not with age, but downy plumage, and then left the earth seeking the stars with his cry. Now his son, with a band of men his own age, rode the mighty centaur, a looming figure that threatened the war water with a massive stone, while the ship's long keel furrowed the sea. Great Ochnus, too, marshaled an army from his native shores. He was the son of the seer Mantro and the Tuscan River, and he gave you, Mantua, your city walls, and his mother's name, Mantua rich in ancestry from many stocks three races of men each with four peoples and she herself the mistress of all with her strong tuscan blood from here too were the five hundred men mezentius armed against himself the river god minchius benacus's son crowned with gray sedge captained them across the sea on their ships of war and on came Aulestes, ponderously, surging through the water on a hundred oars that churned the marble surface of the sea. His ship was the Triton, whose conch alarmed the indigo waves. The figurehead was a man with a shaggy chest, fronting the white caps, but turning into scales and fins below the waist. The water murmured under the half-human form. And so these captains, with their thirty ships, sailed to Troy's aid, cutting the brine with bronze. Day had left the sky, and the gracious moon was treading mid-heaven with steeds of the night. Aeneas, too anxious to sleep, sat at his post, manning the rudder and trimming the sails. Halfway across, a band of his own company met him in the waves, the nymphs whom Sybil had transformed from ships to cities, powers of the sea. They came swimming abreast, equal in number to the brazen keels, once moored to Latin shores. They recognized their king from far off and encircled him in a dance. The most eloquent of them, Simodosia, swam behind the ship, grasped the stern with her right hand, and rose breast high while her left hand paddled the silent water. She spoke to Aeneas, who was caught by surprise. Are you awake, Aeneas, son of the gods? Wake, and haul in tight the sheets to the sails. We, pines from the sacred crest of Ida, now nymphs of the sea, were once your fleet. When the treacherous Rutulian attacked us with fire and sword, we reluctantly broke our mooring chains and have been seeking you over the sea. The great mother, out of pity, gave us this form and granted to us divinity beneath the waves." But your son, Ascanius, is hemmed in by wall and trench, surrounded by Latins bristling for war. Arcadian horsemen, joined by brave Etruscans, are in position. Turnus has resolved to keep these troops from reaching the camp. Rise, then, and with the coming dawn, order your men to arms. Then take the shield that the fire god gave you, invincible and rimmed with gold. Tomorrow's light, if you do not think my words are useless, will look upon heaps of Rutulian dead." Simodosia spoke, and as she departed, gave the stern a push with a knowing hand. The tall ship sped over the water, faster than a javelin or a wind-swift arrow, and the other ships picked up their speed. The Trojan son of Anchises was astonished, but the omen lifted his spirits. Looking up at the vaulted sky, he said this brief prayer. Lady of Ida, mother of the gods, to whom 
Dindima is dear, turreted cities and harnessed lions, lead me now in battle. Fulfill this omen and be propitious, goddess, to your Phrygians. As Aeneas prayed the returning day, ripened with light and the darkness fled. He commanded his men to prepare to attack on his signal and to steal their hearts for battle. He stood on the high stern, and when he had the Trojan camp in sight, he lifted his shield high in the morning light. The Dardanians shouted from the walls, new hope, kindling fury, javelins now flying thick from their hands, like Stramonian cranes calling back and forth under dark clouds. Their clamor pierces the air as they cry in triumph and ride the south winds. Turnus and the Ausonian captains did not know what to make of this until they saw sterns facing the shore and the whole sea crawling with ships. The apex of Aeneas's helmet shot flames into the sky and his shield's golden boss was a radiant bolt of fire glowing. As a comet glows, blood red and baneful, in the dark, liquid night, or like Sirius rising, the star that brings drought and fever to men when it saddens the sky with its baleful light. But Turnus did not back off. Determined to seize the shore and drive the invaders into the sea, he raised his troops' courage with these scalding words. This is what you have been praying for, men, the chance to break the enemy's ranks. The war is in your hands. Remember your wives. Remember your homes and your ancestors' glory. We will engage the enemy in the surf while they're still unsure of their footing. Fortune favors the brave. As Turnus spoke, he decided who would lead the attack and whom he could trust to maintain the siege. Meanwhile, Aeneas was landing his men. Crews were coming down gangways, leaping into the shallows, vaulting down with oars. Tarkon spotted a beach with low surf where the waves glided easily onto the sand. He made a quick decision, turned his prow, and implored his crews. Your elite troops, lean on those oars and ram these ships straight onto the shore. Cut the sands with the beaks and force the keels to plow up the beach. Shipwrecks don't matter once we're on land. Tarkon's men took him at his word. Pulling hard, backs arched, they drove their ships through the foam and onto the Latin fields. Most of them made it, their hulls coming to rest high on dry land. But not your ship, Tarkon. Driving hard into shallow water, it hung up on a sandbar, teetered there in the battering waves, and finally broke up plunging its crew into the breakers, where they floundered among broken oars and floating benches, while a riptide sucked their feet from under them. Turnus wasted no time getting his army onto the shore and making a stand against the oncoming Trojans. Trumpets blared. Aeneas attacked first, charging the Latin ranks, field hands mostly and raw recruits. He ran them over, an omen of what was to come, killing Theron, who more than other men itched to face the hero. Aeneas's sword found the seams in Theron's bronze armor, crunched through the shirt's stiff gold embroidery, and drank from his slashed side. Lycus was next, cut from his dead mother's womb. As a child, he was consecrated to you, Phoebus. Why did you let him escape? Steal as a baby, but not now. Aeneas moved on to Cisseus and giant Gaius, who were clubbing down troops. The weapons of Hercules could not help them now, nor their strong hands, nor their father Melampus, Hercules' companion during all his labors, leaving them dead. Aeneas launched a javelin at Pharus, who was strutting and boasting, and planted it in the man's bawling mouth. And you, poor Sidon, trailing after your new joy, Clitius, with his downy golden cheeks, you would have fallen under the Trojan's hand and lain on the ground most pitiably, forgetful of your love for boys. But your brothers, all seven of them, children of Phorcus, closed ranks around you and threw seven spears. Some glanced off Aeneas's helmet and shield, some Venus diverted, so that they only grazed the hero's body, who then called to Achates. Keep feeding me spears. I'm not going to miss a single Rutulian with these spears that quivered in Greek bodies on Ilium's plain. And he let fly a heavy shaft that crashed through the bronze of Maon's shield and punched a hole through his corslet and chest. Maon's brother Alcanor came to his aid, supporting the fallen man with his right arm, which Aeneas' next spear immediately pierced. The spear kept going and completed its bloody course, leaving Alcanor to examine his own dead hand, dangling by sinews.
Numitor, another brother, pulled the spear out and threw it at Aeneas, but his aim was off, and it grazed the thigh of great Achates. Now Clausus of Curies came to the front, confident in his strength, his youth. He hit dry ops under the chin with a hard throw at some range. The spear pierced his throat as he was speaking and robbed him of voice and life altogether. His forehead hit the ground and clotted blood spewed from his mouth. Clausus went on to kill three Thracians of Boreas's high race and three more far from their native Ismaras and their father Idas, dispatching each of them in different ways. Helasus joined him, and Aruncan bands, as Mesopus, descendant of Neptune, came driving up with his glorious horses. All of them fought to drive back the enemy in this battle on the very threshold of Italy. As clashing winds in the sky's great reaches rise to battle, matched in spirit and strength, and will not yield, nor will clouds or sea, but all nature is deadlocked in struggle, so too the Trojan and Latin ranks clash together in hand-to-hand -hand combat. On another front, a river in torrent had strewn boulders and bushes torn from its banks across the debris. Pallas saw his Arcadians turn and run before the pursuing Latins. Pallas's men were not used to fighting on foot, and the terrain, roughened by the flood, had forced them this once to dismiss their horses. Pallas had only one hope left, to use whatever words he could to restore their courage. Why are you running, my friends? I beg you, by your own brave deeds, by the name of Evander, by the wars you have won, and by my own hope, which rises to match my father's renown, do not put your trust in your feet. We have to hack our way through with swords. There, where the enemy is thickest, is where your country calls you, with palace at your head. We are not fighting gods. We are mortals under attack by mortals. We have as many lives and hands as they do. And now we have the ocean at our backs, the barrier of the sea and no more land. Should we run across the sea all the way to Troy? Pallas spoke and charged into the enemy lines. The first man unlucky enough to cross his path was Lagus, who was trying to uproot a stone of considerable weight. Pallas's spear went into his spine just below the rib cage. He pulled the spear out from the bones, where it stuck, and was ready for his bow, who failed to take him by surprise, although this was his hope. As he rushed in from above, hell-bent with rage at his companion's death, Pallas buried a sword in his wheezing lungs. He got Sthenius next, and Ancamolus of Rotus's ancient line, a man who had dared to sleep with his stepmother, and you too, Larides and Thimber, twin sons of Daucus, fell on the Rutulian plain. As boys, you were indistinguishable from each other, a sweet perplexity to your parents. But Pallas made you easy to tell apart, lopping off your head, Thimber, with Evander's sword, while your severed hand longed for you, Larides, its dying fingers shifting their grip on your sword. The spectacle of these glorious deeds shamed the Arcadians into battle, but Pallas was not done. His spear caught Rotus as he was flying past in his chariot, a chance shot, but a reprieve for Illus, whom Pallas had lined up with his long, hard throw. Rotus intercepted the spear in his flight. From you, noble Teuthras, and your brother Tyres, and rolled from his chariot, heels kicking the Rutulian fields in death. Summer winds the shepherd has hoped for begin to rise, and he sets fires here and there in the woods. Suddenly the spaces between are ablaze, and when Vulcan's battle lines have spread across the fields, the shepherd smiles as he sits and watches the reveling flames. So too your soldiers' valor converged to your joy, Pallas. Alasis countered them, collecting himself behind his shield. This bold warrior brought down Laden, Fares, and Demodocus, sliced off Strimonius's hand with bright steel, and smashed in Thoas's face with stone, scrambling the bones with blood and brains. Halasus's father, prophesying his fate, had hidden the boy in the woods. Later, when his hollow ancient eyes closed in death, the fates laid their hands on Halasus and marked him out for Arcadian spears. Pallas went after him, praying first, Father Tiber, grant to this iron which I am about to throw safe passage through Halasus's ribs. Your oak will hold this weapon and the hero's spoils. The god heard this prayer, while Halasus shielded Emaean. He left his own chest exposed to the Arcadian spear. Lausus, a major part of the Rutulian offensive, did not allow his troops to be panicked by Pallas's killing streak. 
His first move was to cut down Abbas, a node of the battle. And then more youth of Arcadia began to fall. Etruscans fell, and you Trojans too, you whose bodies the Greeks had not destroyed. The armies closed on each other, closely matched, rear guard, crowding front lines so close... The armies closed in on each other, closely matched, rear guard, crowding front lines so close the soldiers could not lift their weapons. On one side, Pallas pressed forward, strains confronted by Lausus, the young heroes nearly equal in age, handsome beyond all, neither destined to return to his homeland. But the lord of Olympus did not permit them to meet face to face. Each was fated to fall soon to a greater adversary. Turnus had a sister, the nymph Juturna, who warned him now to bring aid to Lausus. The hero split the ranks with his swift chariot and called to his men, Stand down from battle, Pallas is mine and mine alone. I only wish his father could watch. When Turnus said this, his men withdrew, and Pallas stood there, marveling at this arrogant command, amazed at Turnus. His eyes took in that giant frame. He scanned the whole scene with a fierce glare and made this response to the great Rutulian. The praise is mine soon, either for prime spoils or a glorious death. My father can live with either fate. Away with your threats. And he strode out to the middle of the field. The Arcadians felt their blood turn to ice, and Turnus vaulted down from his chariot, ready to fight on foot in hand-to-hand -hand combat. A lion, poised on a high vantage point, has caught sight of a bull, med meditating battle and charges. This was how Turnus charged. When Pallas thought he was within spear range, he began his own charge, hoping to balance this mismatch in strength with daring and luck, and he prayed to bright heaven. I beseech you, Hercules, by the welcome you received in my father's house. Come to me now and help me in my need. Let Turnus see me strip the bloody armor from his dying limbs, victorious over him as his eyes close in death. Hercules heard the boy's prayer and stifled a heavy groan, shedding useless tears. Jupiter addressed his son with fatherly words. Each has his own day. Brief is the time and irretrievable the life of every man. Yet, to lengthen fame by deeds is the task of valor. Under Troy's high walls fell many sons of gods, my Sarpedon among them. Fate calls Turnus too, and he has reached the end of his allotted years. Thus Jove, who then turned his eyes from the Rutulian fields. Pallas threw his spear with all his strength, and his sword flashed from its sheath. The spear flew on and struck the top edge of Turnus's shield, forced its way through and nicked his shoulder. Turnus shrugged and balanced his spear for what seemed an eternity. When he threw the iron-tipped oak at Pallas, he said, See if my spear goes in farther. No sooner spoken than the spear point slashed through the center of Pallas's shield with all its layers of iron, of bronze, all the folds of oxide, and then pierced his corslet and burrowed into his chest. Pallas pulled the warm shaft out, but with it came his blood and his life. He fell onto the wound, armor clattering, and his bloody mouth struck the hostile earth. He was dying when Turnus, standing above him, said, Remember, Arcadians, to bring my words to Evander. I send him the palace he deserves, the honor of a tomb, the solace of burial I freely grant, but he will pay dearly for welcoming Aeneas. Turnus spoke, and bracing his left foot on Pallas's corpse, he tore away the massive belt engraved with crime, the sons of Aegyptus murdered by Donus's Danaeus's daughters on their nuptial night, the rooms reeking with blood, the work of Clonus, son of Eurytus, who chased it in gold. Turnus now exulted in this belt and gloried in its possession. The mind of man knows neither fate nor future doom, nor moderation when elated by fortune. The hour will come when Turnus will wish he had paid handsomely for an unharmed palace, and will curse the day he won those spoils. But now Pallas was surrounded by his friends, moaning and weeping as they bore him back, lying on his shield. O oh, Pallas, you will go home to your father a great grief and great glory. This day brought you to war and took you from it, yet you left behind mounds of Rutulians dead. 
It was no vague rumor of disaster that reached Aeneas, but sure intelligence that his men were inches from death, and that it was time to rescue the two friends. He mowed down everything before him with his sword, burning a broad path through the enemy, seeking you, Turnus, flush with slaughter. Pallas, Evander, everything swam in Aeneas' eyes. The table he came to as a stranger, the right hands pledged. Four youths, sons of Solmo, and four of you fens, he took alive to sacrifice them to the shades and pour their blood on the funeral flames. Then he took aim at Magus, who ducked as the spear trembled through the air above him. Then he fell in supplication at Aeneas's knees. By your father's ghost and by your hopes for growing Aeolus, spare my life for my own son and father. Buried deep inside my high house lie talents of chased silver, masses of gold wrought and unwrought. Troy's victory does not turn on me. One life won't matter. He spoke and Aeneas answered him. You can save all that silver and gold for your sons. Turnus did away with such traffic in war when he took Pallas's life. This is the judgment of my father's spirit, of great Anchises, and of Aeolus my son. With these words, he grasped Magus's helmet with his left hand and, bending back the suppliant's neck, buried the sword up to its hilt. Close by was Haemonides, priest of Phoebus and Trivia, head bound with a sacred band, shining in white robes and gleaming armor. armor. Aeneas drove him over the plain, and when the priest fell, bestrided the body and slaughtered it in his own great shadow. Serestus gathered up the armor and carried it off, a trophy for Mars, who walked the lanes of war. Caeculus, born of Vulcan's race, and Umbro from the Marcian hills, filled in the ranks. The Trojan attacked furiously. His sword had already severed Angzer's left arm, which fell to the ground along with his shield. Angzer had been talking big and hoped his strength would match his words, or perhaps he was just raising his spirits and had promised himself a ripe old age, when Tarquitus, strutting in gleaming arms, crossed paths with Aeneas. The nymph Dryope had borne this man to Faunus, who haunts the woods. The Trojan pinned his heavy shield and corslet together with a hard spear cast, and as the boy tried to get some words of supplication out, he sent his head whirling to the ground. Then, as he rolled the warm torso over, he said in a voice without a trace of pity, "'Lie there, you hulk! Your sweet mother will never heap earth above you back home in your country. No, you will be left here for the vultures or thrown into the sea, rolled by waves, and hungry fish will nibble at your wounds. He caught Lucas and Antaeus next, two of Turnus's front-line men, and brave Numa, and blonde Camer's son of noble Volsens, the richest man in all Ausonia and ruler of silent Amicle. Aegean, men say, had a hundred arms, a hundred hands, and shot flames from fifty mouths and chests, when against Jove's thunder he clanged fifty shields and drew as many swords. So Aeneas, in triumph, savaged the field once his blade grew warm. Even the horses that pulled Nepheus's chariot, when they saw the hero advancing in his rage, turned in terror, spilling their master as they raced for the shore. Meanwhile, Lucagus and his brother Liger entered the combat zone in a chariot drawn by two white horses, Liger handling the reins, Lucagus swinging a sword. Aeneas took exception to their ardor for battle and bore down on the duo, towering above them as he pumped his spear. Liger spoke, These aren't Diomedes' horses, you see, or Achilles' chariot, or the plains of Troy. Your war and your life now end in this land. Insane words from Liger, but Aeneas responded with no words at all. He let his javelin fly. And as Lucagus leaned forward with his foot, with his sword, stepping into the stroke with his left foot, the point came through the lower rim of his shield and punctured his left groin. He rolled to the ground, dying, while loyal Aeneas offered him bitter words. Your horses didn't shy Lucagus or run from a shadow. No, you made a flying leap and deserted your team. And he seized the horses as Lucagus' brother bailed out and stood, a picture of misery with outstretched hands. By the Trojan hero that you are, and by the parents who bore such a son, spare this life and have pity on a suppliant. He had more to say, but Aeneas, that's not what you said before, now die with your brother. And Aeneas' sword laid bare Liger's soul. Such were the deaths the Dardanian leader left in his wake, raging like a torrent or a black whirlwind over the plain. At long last, Ascanius and the besieged Trojans burst from the camp and left it behind. Jupiter now turned to Juno and said, Dearest sister and wife, 
You were clearly right when you said Venus alone sustains the Trojans and not their own right hand, alive to war, or their brave hearts enduring of peril. My noble lord, why do you provoke me when I am sick at heart, terrified already of your stern commands? If my love possessed the force it once had, and still should have, you would not forbid me, almighty one, to take Turnus from the war and keep him safe from his father Donus, for his father Donus. As it is, let him perish and pay the Trojans with his innocent blood. And yet his name is of our lineage, for Palumnus sired him four generations back, and he has been generous in heaping your temple threshold with gifts. The Lord of Olympus briefly replied, if you are requesting a reprieve from death for this doomed youth, in complete awareness, it is a respite only, with no further illusions. Take Turnus away from fate and doom. There is this much room for indulgence. However, if your prayers conceal an ulterior motive, and you think the course of the war can be changed, you are badly mistaken. And Juno weeping. What if you were to grant with your heart what you cannot bear to say, and Turnus's life were assured? Now doom is upon this guiltless man, if I am in my right mind. Oh, I would rather be deluded by a baseless fear, and you, who can, change your mind for the better. Juno said these things and launched herself down from high heaven, robed in clouds, driving storms before her. She sought and found Ilium's army and the camp at Laurentum. Then the goddess fashioned a phantom out of mist and shadow a strengthless image of Aeneas, and she counterfeited Trojan weapons, a shield and a plumed helmet for this wondrous apparition. Then she gave it empty words, a voice without thought, and an imitation of Aeneas's gait. It was like the flitting shapes of the dead, or dreams that mocked a slumbering mind. The phantom stalked the front ranks, exultant, and defied the enemy to come forth and fight. Turnus attacked it, hurling a spear that hissed through the air, and the phantom turned, showing its back. Turnus thought he had Aeneas on the run, and, drunk on empty hope, he shouted, Where are you going, Aeneas? Don't run out on your marriage. Come here. This right hand will give you the land you sought through the seas. With cries like this, he gave chase, brandishing his drawn blade, and did not see that the winds were blowing his joy away. Moored to a rock ledge stood the ship that Osinius had sailed from Clusium, ladders down and gangway in place. The phantom of a terrified fleeing Aeneas hurried onto this ship to hide, and Turnus, not a step slower, followed aboard. Taking the gangway in a single stride, he had barely touched the prow when Juno snapped the cable, sweeping the unmoored ship out with the tide. The phantom hid no longer, but soared high to blend with a dark thunderhead. While Aeneas was challenging his absent foe and dealing death to all who crossed his path, the gale carried Turnus far out to sea. Ignorant of how things stood and ungrateful for his reprieve, he looked back toward shore and, lifting his hands to heaven, prayed, Almighty Father, am I so unworthy, and is it your will I be punished like this? Where am I bound? What path is taking me? If this is me so far from home, where have I come from? Will I see the walls of Laurentium again? What about the men who followed me to war? I have abandoned them all, a disgrace beyond words, to an ignominious death. I see them scattered now, hear their groans as they fall. What can I do? How could the earth gape deep enough for me? Winds, take pity on me, and drive this ship aground on a reef. I implore you, push it onto a shoal, where neither the Rutulians nor Rumor herself will ever know my shame. As Turnus said these things, his mind rocked back and forth. Should he, because of his disgrace, impale himself on his pitiless sword, or drive into the waves and swim to shore to fight the Trojans again? He tried each way, three times, and three times great Juno held him back, restraining him in heartfelt pity. He glided on, cutting through the waves, and the tide bore him back to his ancestral city. Jupiter now prompted fiery Mezentius to take the battle to the jubilant Trojans, but it was the Tyrrhenians who responded, focusing all their hatred and all their weapons on this one man. He took it all, like a high cliff that juts out into the ocean, exposed to the wind's fury and the pounding surf, enduring all the menace of sea and sky, but motionless itself. So too Mezentius, as he laid out on the ground Hebrus, son of Dolichaean, and with him 
Lategus, and Palmus, a man fast on his feet. Lategus he caught full in the face and mouth with a huge slab of granite. Palmus, though, he hamstrung and left him writhing slowly, while he gave his armor to Lausus, his son, along with the plumes to fix on his helmet. Evanthes was next, the Phrygian, and Mimas, the same age as Paris, and his constant shadow when they were boys. Theano bore him to Amicus on the very night that Hecuba, pregnant with a firebrand, gave birth to Paris. Paris now sleeps in his ancestral city, and Mimas rests in an unmarked grave on Laurentium's shore. When a boar driven from a mountain by dogs, it has lived for years on piney vesselus, or has fed on reeds in the Laurentine marsh, reaches the hunter's nets, it halts and snorts, and raises its hackles. No one has the courage to come near enough to vent his rage, so they throw their javelins and shout at it from a safe distance. The boar is undaunted and turns in all directions, gnashing its teeth as it shakes off the javelins stuck in its back. Just so, none of those who harbored righteous rage had courage enough to draw a sword and face Mezentius, preferring instead to launch spears and insults from a safe distance. Akron, a Greek, had come from ancient Corythus, leaving his home and an unfinished wedding. Mezentius saw him, wrecking battalions, helmets, crest shining with his bride's purple. A lion that has not fed will range the deep woods mad with hunger until he spots a timid roe or an antlered stag. Mouth agape in exultation, mane bristling, he crouches intently over the warm viscera. A foul gore bathes his cruel jaws. So too, Mezentius, charging into the massed enemy ranks. Akron had no chance. He went down hard, hammering the black earth with his heels. His splintered spear dyed red with his blood. This put Orodes on the run. Mezentius, disdaining a cheap shot from the rear, caught up with Orodes and faced him man to man, besting him not with stealth but superior strength. Then he planted his foot on the body, and straining to pull out his spear, he cried to his troops, Great Orodes is down, men! No small part of the war! Shouting in unison, his men raised the victory cry, but Orodes, breathing his last, said, I shall not die unavenged, and you... Whoever you are will not celebrate long. The same fate awaits you. You too will soon lie dead in these fields. And Mezentius, with a sneering smile, now die. As for me, the Lord of gods and men will see to my fate. And he pulled the spear out. Iron slumber pressed hard on Orodes' eyes, and their light faded into everlasting night. Now Catechus cut down Alcathus, Sarcator killed Hydaspes, Rapo, Parthenius, and tough Orses, Mesopus, both Clo Clonius and Lycan's son, Erechites, the former, as he sprawled on the ground unhorsed, the latter as he advanced on foot. Aegis, a uh, Lycan, also advanced on foot, but was struck down by Valerius, who had his ancestor's valor. Salius killed Thronius and was killed by Neil sees a good man with both a spear and a bow. Stern Mars balanced the suffering and death. Men on both sides killed and were killed, victor and vanquished, and neither side yielded. Looking down from the high halls of Job, Venus sitting across from Saturnian Juno, the gods pitied the senseless passion of men, while pale Tisiphone, the fury, raged among thousands. Still, Mezentius, pumping his huge spear, stormed across the plain. Think of great Orion stalking on foot the deeps of Nereus, plowing through the water, shoulders above the waves, or hefting a mountain ash, his feet treading the earth, his head shrouded in clouds. So too, Mezentius, gigantic in armor. Aeneas, spotting him in the distance, closed ground quickly. Mezentius waited for his noble opponent, standing unperturbed in his immovable bulk. His eyes measured the space between them, and when Aeneas was in range, he said, May this right hand, which is my god, and this spear, which I am about to throw, come through for me now. Lausus, you yourself, clad in the spoils torn from that robber's corpse, will be my trophy over Aeneas. He spoke and let fly. The spear hissed through the air, and glancing off Aeneas's shield, pierced Antores under his ribs. Noble Antores, an Argive companion of Hercules, who had joined Evander and settled in an Italian town. Now he lay dying, with a wound meant for another, gazing at the sky and remembering sweet Argos. 
then Aeneas threw. The hero's spear punched through the curved shield's triple bronze, through the inwoven linen and oxhide layers, and losing speed, struck low in the groin. Aeneas was glad to see the Tuscan's blood, and, drawing his sword, moved in eagerly on an anxious Mezentius. Lausus, watching, groaned deeply for love of his father, and tears rolled down his face. Neither your death nor your heroic deeds of antiquity can confer belief in prowess so great, nor you yourself, noble young man, so worthy of memory, will I leave in silence. Mezentius gave ground, disabled and hobbled, Aeneas's spear still stuck in his shield. His son ran into the space between them, hurling himself into battle, and just as Aeneas brought his sword sweeping down, Lausus parried the blade from below and held the hero in check. His comrades came up from behind with loud cries and held off the enemy with a hail of missiles until the father, under the protection of the son's shield, could make his good retreat. Aeneas raged but took cover. When the storm breaks and pours down clouds of hail, every plowman and farmer runs from the fields, and the traveler huddles under a river bank or rocky ledge, while the rain falls on the lands. When the sun comes out, they go on with the day's work. So too Aeneas, overwhelmed by javelins, endured the war cloud until all its thunder was gone. But all the while he taunted Lausus and threatened him. You're headed for death, Lausus. Why rush it by daring what's beyond your strength? Your filial devotion is blinding you. But Lausus was much too wound up to think, and now the Dardanian leader's rage was mounting higher, and the fates gathered up the last threads of Lausus's life. Aeneas drove his sword straight through the young body he faced and up to the hilt, the point piercing the shield, far too fragile to counter his threat. And the tunic his mother had woven of soft gold threads, blood filled his chest, his soul left his body and sighed through the air to the shades below. When Anchises' son looked on his dying face, so strangely pale, he groaned in pity and stretched out his hand. There shone in that face the image of his own devotion to Anchises. For all his sense of duty, what now, poor boy, can Aeneas give you for such glorious deeds? What is worthy of so great a heart? Keep the arms in which you delighted, and if it matters to you now, I commit you to the spirits and ashes of your ancestors, and may this comfort you in death's sadness. You fell by the hand of the great Aeneas. Then he scolded Laus's men for hanging back and lifted their prints from the ground, where blood was fouling his finely bound hair. Meanwhile, his father was washing his wound on the Tiber's bank, leaning back on a tree trunk. His bronze helmet hung from a branch nearby and his helmet ar heavy arms were at rest on the grass. His men stood around him as he gasped for breath and tried to ease his sore neck. His comb beard flowed down on his chest. He asked for Lausus over and over and sent messengers to call him back and deliver the commands of his despondent father. But Lausus's men were bearing him back on his armor, dead, a great warrior undone by a mighty wound. They wept as they came, and Mezentius's foreboding heart knew their wail from afar. He defiled his white hair with dust, lifted his hands to heaven, and clinging to the corpse. Was life so sweet to me, son, that I let you face the enemy in my place, you whom I begot? Am I your father, saved by your wounds, alive through your death? On oh, now at last the bitterness of exile comes home to me. The wound is driven deep. I have stained your good name my son, with my guilt, I, driven by resentment from the throne and scepter of my fathers. The penalty I owe my native land and bitter countrymen is overdue. I should have given up my guilty life through any kind of death. Now I still live and have not yet left the light of day, but leave I will. As he spoke, he raised himself on his injured leg, and though slowed by his wound, he held his head high and called for his horse his pride and solace, on which he rode, victorious from every battle. Now he spoke to the grieving creature words such as these. Robus, 
We have lived long, if anything lasts long for mortals. Today, either you will bear off Aeneas' head and bloody spoils and avenge me, the suffering of Lausus, or, if we cannot find our way through force, you will die with me. For I do not think, my brave one, that you would endure a stranger's orders or a Trojan lord. He spoke, mounted, and settled into position, loading both hands with wetted javelins. His head glittered with bronze and bristled with horsehair crests as he galloped off into the thick of battle, his heart a seething mass of shame and of grief verging on madness. Three times his voice boomed out, Aeneas! Aeneas knew the voice, and filled with joy he prayed, May the father of the gods and Apollo on high make this happen! It's your move, Mezentius. Having said this, Aeneas moved forward with leveled spear. But Mezentius, my son's gone, and you try to frighten me, you murderer. This was the only way you could destroy me. We do not fear death, nor do we hold back for the gods. Break it off. I come to die. But first, I have these gifts for you. He spoke and let fly with a javelin, then wheeling in a circle, hit home with another and another. But the shield's heavy gold withstood them all. Three times he rode around a standing Aeneas, launching javelins as he circled to the left. Three times the Trojan pivoted around with a forest of spears on his shield's bronze skin. Then, weary of prolonging the fight and of plucking out javelins and feeling the heat of this unequal combat, he considered his options and struck suddenly, hurling his spear squarely between the war horse's temples. The great stallion reared, pawing the air. He threw his rider, and then, falling himself, hit the ground headfirst, disjoining his shoulder and entangling Mezentius. The Trojans and Latins lit up the sky with their cries. Aeneas ran up, drew his sword, and standing over him cried, You're not so tough now, are you, Mezentius? The Tuscan lifted his eyes, drank in the bright air, and when he had recovered his senses, answered, Bitter enemy, why do you taunt me and threaten me with death? Killing me is no sin. I did not come into battle for a truce. My Lausus did not seal such a pact between me and you. I ask only one thing. If the vanquished have any claim to clemency, let my body be covered by earth. I know my people's hatred surrounds me. Guard me from their rage. Let me join my son in the tomb. Mezentius said these things and did not flinch when the sword entered his throat and his life sluiced out in streams of blood.